I'm Christina Lowry, CEO of Girl Rising, and I'm here with Judith Regist, Girl Rising's Vice President of Programs, and yet another one of our amazing Young Leaders Task Force members, Lucas Tadone. Hello, Christina and Judith. It's great to be with both of you today. I'm a proud member of the Girl Rising community. We have already seen so many of the photos so many of you have posted on social media. So for those of you just joining us now, we would love to meet you. Write Girl Rising on your hand, take a selfie, and post it on your favorite social media with the hashtag rising together. Judy? Well, this day, International Day of the Girl, is my favorite. And as you've heard throughout this event, we have been dealing with so many issues from climate change to justice and equality. And why girls' education is one of the best investments the world can make for our future. This moment is a recognition of the long arc to advance justice and equality for girls. It is a moment of celebration, reflection, and planning. Celebration for what, for what we have accomplished, reflection for what is possible, and planning for what is yet to become. And Lucas, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Lucas, who's going to tell us what's next to come in this session today. Thanks, Judith. In this session, the Girl Rising Global Community, we have some very special events. We are going to hear from Girl Rising ambassador, actor, and producer, David Oyelowo. We are going to meet some of the incredible students who study at the School of Leadership in Afghanistan, the only boarding school for girls in Afghanistan. We will hear their voices, their aspirations, and their inspiration. And Christina will lead a discussion called Beyond School Walls about some of the critical factors beyond academics that help break gender norms and open up opportunities for girls. We are also going to have a yoga class in our breakout room to help keep us all mindful and feeling energized. Back to Judy. Well. In the second session, we'll hear from teachers around the world using the GRR curriculum, the Go Rising curriculum with young people, using it to help young people see beyond their borders and think critically about the world. Now, before we get started, I wanna hand it over to Lucas, who's going to share some more guidelines with us today, since he was one of the key uh, task force members who organized this event. Lucas? Thanks again. First, our detailed agenda and program can be found on the Girl Rising website, girlrising.org. We are also very pleased to have real-time translations in six languages, Spanish, French, Mandarin, Hindi, Arabic, and Bengali. We are sharing the link for translation right here on our chat and on the Girl Rising website. One last note before we get started. This is a safe platform where all voices are heard and respected. Bullying comments will be removed, and if you see any inappropriate comments, please alert our team at idg at girlrising.org. And now, let's hear from David Oyelowo. Hi, it's David Oyelowo here talking to you from a film set somewhere in Canada. But I am so happy to be with all of you today, even if it's virtually, um, as we come together to celebrate the power of girls throughout the world. We are living through an extraordinary time, and at this moment when we are all facing challenges, fears, and uncertainties, today I have two important messages for the thousands of young people who are part of this summit. First, I wanna say thank you. Thank you to Okikola in Nigeria for adapting new technologies to keep young girls learning. Thank you to Aryan from Afghanistan, fighting for the rights of refugees. Thank you to Taijul for delivering educational materials and health supplies in rural India. Thank you to Winter for fighting for racial justice in the United States. Thank you to the young people around the world who are leading the way for all of us. With your passion, your courage, your moral clarity, you have the power to address the most important issues of our time and create a world that is more fair and more just. A world where all girls have the opportunity to pursue a future of their own choosing. My second message is keep going. Keep going, because we need you. 
All of you, including the estimated 129 million girls who don't have access to education, including the millions of teenage girls who are at risk of never returning to the classroom when lockdowns end. We need your creativity, your generosity, and your solutions. And all of us need to make sure that girls everywhere have the opportunity to learn so that they can fulfill their potential and contribute to their communities in meaningful and game-changing ways. So, keep going. I am with you. We are with you. We are Girl Rising. What a great message. Keep going. Uh, besides being an incredible actor and producer, David is a fierce advocate for women and girls' rights around the world. He created a scholarship in conjunction with the Jenko Foundation, which supports female victims of terror attacks and gender-based inequality in his native Nigeria. And he regularly speaks about the important role men and boys play in supporting gender equality. Thank you, David, for sharing this message with us. A special thank you also to all of our wonderful sponsors who are helping to make this day possible. Thank you to HP, Viacom CBS, French Press Productions, Shearman and Sterling, Streamit, and Hogan Levels. Thanks for supporting our work and our mission. And now, once again, Lucas is going to tell us what's coming next. All day today, we have been hearing from inspiring people who are making a difference in their communities and in their world following their curiosity, their creativity, and their vision for a better world. We have a special message from two young leaders right now, both from the Council on International Education Exchange, one of Girl Rising partners, who regularly uses Girl Rising's film and educational tools in their civic leadership program. Hello, my name is Marcel Wahba, and I'm a member of the CIEE Board of Directors. I'm an Egyptian-American and a first-generation immigrant to the United States. I'm a retired American diplomat, and after serving many years overseas, primarily in the Middle East, I now live in Washington, D.C. So marhaba to all the Arabic speakers out there. It's a great honor for me to address the Girl Rising Summit on the International Day of the Girl. I hope this very special event inspires you to start thinking about how you plan to change the world. Girls and young women from every background and every nationality can contribute in so many different ways. I think of young women like Greta Thunberg, the brave Swedish environmental activist who at 15 gained international recognition for reminding all of us of the existential crisis arising from climate change. Or Dina Musa, the young Egyptian scientist who at 17 invented a product that can save lives around the world by stopping severe bleeding in five to 10 seconds, much faster than the usual medicines used at hospitals today. It is difficult to speak of girls and young women who change the world without mentioning Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who passed away last week. She spent her entire life fighting for justice and human rights. But when she graduated with a law degree, she could not get a job as a lawyer because she was a woman. She struggled and persevered until she ended up serving on the highest court of the United States and therefore changing many people's lives. So it is never too early to dream and to plan about how you will change the world. I am Girl Rising. Hello, Girl Rising. My name is Ala Mahmoud, and I'm a CIE work and travel alumnus since 2016, and I'm a co-founder of Ex-Egypt Association. I live in a small city in Egypt where only few girls had a voice, where only few girls could make their own decisions and have a role in our community. Back in time, gender stereotypes and inequality were prevalent to the degree that girls couldn't trust their own decisions. They couldn't control their life till marriage. That's not fair, right? So, in 2017, I had an idea to help young girls in my community and help them gain self-confidence, exercise leadership skills, and break through gender stereotypes. Not just following what they are being told, 
Besides studying medicine, we work it tirelessly to make this challenge a trigger to initiate this association. We tried hard to find time to do what we love as we care for our community. Proudly, we are now over 300 volunteers all over Egypt. So far, we organized more than 15 children camps that involved more than 400 children, where they learned their rights and opportunities all through using sports. I believe that all of us have a role in preparing young girls to become future change makers. We should inspire them to discover their potentials and talents and raise awareness about gender equality so they can speak, lead and change. We all know that women and girls represent half of the world's population. So supporting them will definitely raise the productivity and will make them able to raise a family and help their community. It all starts with a simple idea. So here is my word to all the young girls all over the world. Don't sit on the bench. Get in the game. I'm Alaa Mahmoud. I'm a CIE change maker and I'm a girl rising. Turning the corner here, this summer, Girl Rising launched My Story, the Girl Rising Storytelling Challenge in collaboration with our partner HP. We invited people from all around the world to share their story of how they're responding to this moment in time. And we received over 1,500 submissions from over 90 countries, including from students at the School for Leadership in Afghanistan, as Lucas said, the first and only boarding school for girls there also known as SOLA. SOLA was founded by longtime friend and Girl Rising ambassador, Shabana Basish Rasik, when she was only a junior in college. And incredibly, this wasn't even her first school that she founded. The first she built in her father's village when she was only 16. Please meet the extraordinary girls from SOLA, followed by two of the My Story Storytelling Challenge submission. Yes, I'm covered, but it doesn't mean I'm disappeared. I still have my voice. I am an Afghan girl. No one should think that girls can do anything. Girls can change their lives and the lives of others. Afghan girls are so talented. These talented girls are changing their society to a shiny society. I am proud to be a girl. Girls are important in our society because they are brave and strong. They face problems like getting married at a young age. Their families don't let them to go and study abroad. But most of these girls are proof themselves to their families that they deserve all the good things in the world. A girl can build a family, uh, raise a child and even work outside of the house. Some of the girls want to speak up and raise their voices and feelings. But society and culture don't allow them. They have rights to be noticed. I am an Afghan girl who has faced many challenges. But look where I am now, following my dream. I want to solve their problems and draw their feelings and voices by my art. Girls are beautiful and valuable in the world. Everyone should respect them, but in Afghanistan, no one has this quality. But I'm sure that we can change this. Every single girl has her own powers. But most importantly, we should support each other. Because when all women are united, they will be stronger than ever. Like lots of other brave women, I risked my life through letting my daughter educate. I accept the risk and with unconditional love to my daughter. I give her wings to fly and make the life I couldn't. When I see her arguing with her brother about her rights and have an opinion on things, I feel accomplished. 
I do feel proud when my daughter has beautiful goals for her country and she's working very hard achieving her goals. My daughter and lots of other girls are now a hope and a motive to lots of other girls to once again raise like a moon and shine, to remove the darkness of the world and change the color of the world. I do feel proud. I want to tell the world we are wise, we are hard working, we can do anything. Hurdles in life has taught me the importance of education. I can go with my friends. I can say whatever I want. All of these without being afraid. I want every Afghan girl to be a free bird with the gift of education. When I study, I can tend their minds. When I become big, I will make schools for girls and boys. In that schools, they can study and their minds will be open. As an Afghan girl, I want to change the mentality of my people. I want girls to improve. The world needs to now know that girls are strong. A strong woman looks at challenge and the eye and gets it away. Despite all the challenges, I am a girl who believes so much in her dreams, who never give up soon. And I am very optimistic about my future. I would like to say that we all girls around the world must stand by each other hand, not to criticize each other, but to give hope to each other. Remember, my dear sister, that failure always makes us strong. Even though we face many obstacles and problems, what we can do is to take each other's hand and help ourselves and each other, just like a fruit tree, which benefits both the air and the earth. My goal in building was that if the girls were under the tent, they would still benefit even like a fruitful tree. Amazing thoughts exist in her imaginations. Although she has them, there are wrong thoughts all around her. Black and white squares, wrong judgments, and down looks on her. But she still has those high thoughts. She is brave and wants to control it. She knows she has to do a lot, so she won't give up. The last uh, part, it shows that now girls are educated and they can do anything they want. I'm a girl and proud it to be a girl. Let me fly as a butterfly, then see what I can try. Girls are like sand and they can bring a shine in a society. A girl with tears just don't know what she hears. A girl smiles cause she always rises. In this world of dishonesty, a girl always tries with all problems and challenges. A girl still wants her rights. A girl change a family, but I will change lives. Nothing can stop my mind cause my dream still flies. They push a girl back, but that girl still fights. No one can quiet me, I still have my voice. My words show what I am, a girl from deep of her heart still writes. An Afghan girl. If you hear this word, a picture of me would rapidly appear in your mind. A girl covered in dust, wearing a huge umbrella dress with a long scarf in a blue burqa. What you don't think of me is, I'm a human being. I go to school and learn about humanity which makes me rad and strong. And I believe no religion is better than humanity. I love to wear long scarves filled with many different colors because they bring joy. And under the blue burqa, I influence people with my knowledge. I'm a girl and I choose to live in a colorful world.
Hi, I'm Faith. And I'm Faithfulness. We're identical twin advocates shaping the Nigeria we want, and we're students of Abuja and Nigeria. We fight for inclusive and equitable quality education because we believe that this will promote better economic outcome for the girl child and drive sustainable development in Nigeria. Even though physical platforms, schools have been shut down and social events have been cancelled. Many children in our community don't have access to online education or even access to the internet. Does this mean they wouldn't learn? So we decided to do something about it. We came up with this idea of starting a prep class for children in nursery and primary school. We guide the children whom their parents don't have access to online education to teach them. We also took into consideration safety health measures. We got a space. We researched for educational materials online, videos, tutorials, and things to aid their teaching with our data. We also made sure we follow safety health precautions by ensuring they have their facial marks, always sanitizing their hands and washing their hands before and after the prep class. And we also educated them about the virus so they are aware. And guess what? It's over in one class started this prep class. To our greatest surprise, we have still receiving testimonies from their parents on the educational improvement of their children. And they are also excited to see that their children are learning again. Most of these children can now sing new rhymes, solve various mathematical problems, have better knowledge on health measures, and some of them are also learning how to read and write. It's got more interesting to see other teenagers are like us. Yes, four of them, they were inspired and volunteered to teach classes, and so we do. Due to this growth, we decided to provide morning and evening classes for different sets of children. For even a month plus of this prep class, we are all fine, healthy, and still learning. Today, these children are not left behind. And we, and we are super excited because we are impacting the lives of these children. Yeah. And, and we are adopting innovative strategies that will enable us to still continue our work in disadvantaged community and ensure everyone is learning and no one is left behind. The future is changing and we believe we should change the way we prepare for it. Here's what you can do to help contribute your voices no matter how little they may seem. Volunteer and support a course you're passionate about. Like, retweet and share messages from platforms that promote inclusive and equitable quality education for the great child. Even in the midst of the global pandemic. I have some story to tell you, but I'm going to tell you in a different way. Tell me how would human life be without women and their bravery? How many souls, how many lives are rescued from suffering days and nights? There's a place that the world can't see, invisible to the state's eyes. Its name refers to paradise, but Paraisopolis strives to brighten the savage sky. In a sky where only some stars are allowed to shine, a virus came to make it darker. Poverty, family, genocide make the black slums struggle harder. People are up to 10 times more likely to die. And families are packed together. They don't know if there will be a last meal to survive and their walls depend on the good weather. But luckily, there are brave women rejecting that fate. They are the street presidents, and they are helping families survive the, out the outbreak. Where there is no response from the governors, these women are taking care of neighbors, tracking cases, raising money, sewing masks, feeding seniors. The program created as cases began to explode is one of many solutions favelas have found. found. They are hiring ambulances, creating funds, building independence, healing their wounds. In this stunning cradle of hopefulness, these women have a lot to teach about resilience, strength, and braveness. But above all, about how bottom-up policies are the only exit to justice, to equity, to mankind finally living peace. Hello everyone, Merhaba, hoş geldiniz, and welcome to Beyond School Walls, a panel discussion on some of the critical success for girls' equality and their life opportunities besides academics. I'm Selina Znaldum, a member of the Girl Rising Young, Young Leaders Task Force, and I am so happy to be with all of you today. We all know that access to education is essential, yes, but not sufficient. Achieving gender equity means far more than girls in classrooms. I want to say hello to Carol Awala of Big Picture Learning, to Jennifer Cooper from UN Women, and to Pamela Andusa Ambonda from Pathfinder International. 
Hello, we are so happy you're here today. You can find their biographies and information about their organizations in our event program on the Girl Rising website. Each of you is working in an area that is critical to opening up opportunities for girls. I would like, I would like to start by asking each of you to introduce briefly um, why access to reproductive health services, opportunities for, to participate in sports, Preparing for the transition from school to career is so critical for girls. Pamela, let's start with you. Nice to join everyone today. Adolescence is a particularly critical stage for girls. It's marked by rapid biological and psychological changes, as well as social expectations of how their lives should unfold. So for many girls in developing countries, including Kenya, where I live, Adolescence also marks a time of extreme vulnerability to child marriage, to teenage pregnancy, to sexual and or gender-based violence, to nutritional deficiency and exposure to drugs and substance abuse, and most worryingly, HIV and AIDS. It also marks a time when pressures of social norms and retrogressive or harmful cultural practices such as female genital cutting place new restrictions on what girls can do and who they can be. Lack of access to education increases vulnerability to these risks and constraints. Parkfind International supports sexual and reproductive health and rights. We believe in the right to reproductive health as a component of overall health throughout the life cycle for adolescents and girls. We believe in the right to reproductive health decision-making including voluntary choice in marriage, family formation, determination of the number, timing, and spacing of one's children, and the right to access information and means to exercise voluntary choice. We believe in equality and equity for adolescent girls and boys to enable individuals to make free and informed choices, free from discrimination based on gender. And finally, we believe in sexual and reproductive health security including freedom from sexual violence and coercion, human trafficking, and the right to privacy. Thank you, Pamela, and we'll come back to talk some more about your work. Um, Carol, I'd like to ask you, we at Girl Rising have the pleasure of working with you on a regular basis as one of our uh, partners under our Girl Rising Global Education Fund. Can you share with us how Big Picture Learning Kenya is reshaping the secondary school learning experience and why? What's not working now? Why is it not enough to just get girls into school? Thank you so much for the opportunity. So uh, Kenya Big Picture Learning is an education organization that partners with community high schools that serve marginalized uh, students from marginalized communities. And you know the education that is being provided in, in school is not enough. Uh, it's really good, but it's not enough. Um, when we think about the fact that we are preparing our children for the global market, we are preparing our kids for, you know, opportunities. There are kids in this country, you know, Kenya, where I'm coming from, that, you know, that access is still a big dream uh, that may, they might not achieve. So at Big Picture Learning, we um, we are looking at it, at the, you know, the, the support that we provide more holistically, we do not just work directly with students. What we do is uh, support a critical mass of adults. So we are looking at teachers, uh, we are looking at the school leaders, we are looking at families, we are looking at mentors. In the communities that we serve, and that's the community that I was born, I, want, I was born and brought up in one of the you know, largest informal settlements, it's called Kibera. Those four things that I've mentioned really lack. We have families that are not able to support girls because they are busy earning a living. We have teachers who do not have teaching certification. They have very limited knowledge about what that preparation for girls could look like. We have, you know, mentors who are disengaged from the kids. We have people who want to mentor, but they don't know how to do it. So for us, we do the support. We, we provide the knowledge, but also the tools for these 
a group of people so that they, we have a critical mass of adults who can support our boys and the girls. It's just very important. Yeah. Jennifer, um, girls around the world love and love to play and participate in team sports. Being a former volleyball player myself, I know that they gain confidence and learn skills far beyond athletic skills. Can you tell us why the right to participate in sports has become such a priority to you and women and also some of the ways you are using sports to address broader gender equality? Thank you so much. Um, this is such an important topic. And um, I would say that uh, the recognition within you and women about sport as an effective tool and driver for gender, for gender equality has really been gaining uh, importance. It's grown out of our, par our partnership with the International Olympic Committee, which we really started in 2016 during the Rio Olympic Games. Uh, we're working closely with the IOC on a project called One Win Leads to Another that's based in Brazil, and it provides opportunities for, some of, for girls from some of the most marginalized communities to benefit from sport practice combined with uh, life skills training. And the results that this program has delivered for these girls and for their communities have just been so quick and so obvious. Um, we see the girls themselves measurably um, increasing their view of themselves as leaders with the self-esteem going way up and rather quickly. It provides peer-to-peer -peer learning and support for the girls, for them to share their problems, for them to find solutions and understanding. They also learn, you know, the basics about their bodies, how to care for themselves, about how to prevent uh, pregnancy and sexually transmitted infections. And what we see really, I think, is a kind of a bottom-up empowerment of these girls who are really changing the attitudes of their parents and their families, seeing these girls as capable, and also that's transmitting out into the communities. And now that we've been, uh, we've seen this program under implementation for going nearly four years now, we see some of the graduates, some of the older girls taking on, because they see this is so valuable for themselves, that they're taking on the responsibility to bring together younger girls from the community and they're, they're training them in the same knowledge that they learned and that they developed through One Win Leads to Another in their own experience. But one thing that is a big challenge right now and this is not only in our program in Brazil, but around the world. Unfortunately, these girls, we had to, we had to put the program on pause because of the COVID um, you know, closures. And unfortunately, many, most of the girls in these communities, they don't have access to online tools. And so we couldn't just create a digital curriculum to keep them engaged. So we're a bit concerned about what's happening you know, and to these girls in these communities under the, under the closures. So one thing I think we need to think about is how do we get more of these girls to access digital tools so that, you know, when we can prevent this kind of thing from happening in the future and have more connectivity. But overall, you know, the, the work on sport has become very important and it's super effective as a tool to achieve gender equality. Jennifer, thank you so much. And I have a follow-up question for you. I also am astounded by the data that points to the measurable impact that playing sports can have um, on, on a girl in so many, in so many things, um, building specific skills. Many female leaders uh, of major companies point to sports as this formative experience for them um, as leaders and help develop their leadership skills. And yet, um, all around the world, uh, sports is simply not something that is thought of as appropriate for girls. Um, what do you think needs to happen at both a government policy level and a societal level to ensure that girls do have increased opportunity uh, to play sports? Wow. Yeah. Um, there are a lot of obstacles, a lot of barriers. And, um, you know, sometimes many of these are culturally specific. So, you know, we have to look to make sure that these uh, programs, for example, one one leads to another at the grassroots level, you know, are translated into the kind of national cultural context so that they, you know, address some of the specific issues. But 
on a in the sort of in the big picture sense, um, this year is 2020. It represents the 25th anniversary of the global landmark agreement on women's rights, which is the Beijing Platform for Action. And as a part of that celebration and trying to bring more recognition to the importance of this agreement, as well as to the unfinished business of, uh, of Beijing, we have launched uh, something called Sport for Generation Equality, which is bringing together multi-stakeholder coalition to drive action um, on the part of, for example, governments, the private sector, the media, the world of sport, and also to bring attention to the rights of the girl child, which are also very firmly embedded within the Beijing platform. So we've invited all these various stakeholders to come together and to, based on a set of principles, to you know, see themselves within that and to make changes. For example, governments, we know what role governments can play. You know, the, the role of Title IX, for example, in the United States um, is a fantastic example of what governments can do to just create equal access and funding. We also ask the donor community to embrace sport as a driver for achieving all of these multiple development benefits that we see and to fund some of the effective programs, more of the effective programs like we see in Brazil. I mean, in addition, I would say that, uh, you know, what you were saying, Christina, which is, uh, you know, Ernst and Young on the 40th anniversary of Title IX, they did a study, you know, about the economic benefits, for example, coming out of Title IX. You know, this is a U.S. thing, but we know that 96% of C-suite women participated in high school or college sports. So, you know, the return on investment in the long term is also clear. And finally, I think it's really important that we change the professional and elite sport world as well, because the role models need to change. You know, we see that, for example, coming out of the Women's World Cup last year, the excitement around the world when both girls and boys get to see powerful women winning, leading, and also becoming advocates for gender equality. So from the perspective and the plan for sport for generation equality is really to make these connections in a kind of holistic way between what's happening in the, in the big media world and the big sport world and all the way down to the grassroots because we see this as a kind of a virtuous cycle and we'd like to reach youth also with the message of Beijing so that they're aware of their rights. Carol, I'd love to ask you also, um, part of what I hear you saying is that to truly prepare young people for the world, schools must go beyond just teaching basic academics. What needs to happen at a governmental level, the Ministry of Education level, for example, to support the kind of learning you are um, advocating for? Thank you for the question. So. Um... I work with the uh, community high school, which uh, in Kenya are not considered government schools. Uh, but when you, you think about the kids, you know, every Kenyan child is under the Kenyan government. We do not have children who are not government children, you know. So one of the things that, you know, um, I think uh, our government, for example, can do um, in, in ensuring that, you know, girls get access to you know opportunities is to support the work of the community school so many times we find that there's a mismatch between what the community schools do it's actually like a mini competition between what you know the community schools are doing and you know what the government schools are doing there's just uh, very little support uh, that the community schools you know are getting and then uh, kenya recently introduced um, a CBC, a competency-based curriculum, uh, which uh, requires schools to begin talking to children about careers, uh, to begin, you know, doing projects that prepare them for life and prepare them for the real world. Because the current um, the current uh, education um, doesn't prepare the Kenyan child for the job market and doesn't prepare you know, the girls for the job market. So recently it was um, launched in the primary school. And I think based on my experience supporting teachers in those schools, there's just a lot that can be done. 
So I think um, the government could partner more with organizations like Big Picture, who are already in the field and working with these schools to ensure that girls have more opportunities. We, since 2018, you know, 2018, we've been taking girls out of school. We call it out of the class into the world because majority of the Kenyan kids spend a lot of time in class cramming facts. When they leave the class, it's like, you know, you're not ready for the job market. The government can intervene. They can partner with organizations such as Girl Rising and Big Picture Learning to scale this a bit more. They could provide funding that the school need. A lot of things that happen in our school is teachers are willing and school leaders are on board, but the resources are not matched. So I think matching, you know, the, you know, funding, giving funding and ensuring that the community schools, which serve majority of the Kenyan children, have access to funding, I think is, is, is also another way uh, of ensuring that every girl has access to opportunities. Thanks, Carol. Um, and Pamela, I wanted to ask you also, Carol just mentioned um, what governments can do to set standards, to increase funding. Um, sexual and reproductive health education is a, is a delicate subject in, in many countries, uh, where I am, the United States included. Um, what do you think needs to happen at a policy level to support the teaching of sexual and reproductive health education, body literacy, as I've heard some of your colleagues call it, um, to both girls and boys and make it part of a standard education? That's a, a very interesting um, question and one that we're struggling with even um, in my country of Kenya, because despite the existence of um, WHO anchored policies and frameworks that promote access to quality sexual and reproductive health services and GBV prevention and response, and we have all of these in Kenya, um, the issue is the comprehensive and coordinated implementation. And uh, this, has been a challenge and continues to be. Um, we're seeing adolescents having sex earlier and we're seeing uh, increased rates of teen pregnancy and school dropout. And as you all know, and I know you agree, being in education acts as a powerful protective factor for adolescent girls and young women and is a route for girls' empowerment to determine their own destiny. Adolescent girls are still being married off in my country and in many parts of the globe um, to older men and some deeply entrenched patriarchal cultures, including in my own, they're using contraception later on in life, especially those in rural areas because of issues around access and they're sub being subjected to harmful traditional practices such as FGC. So all of these practices are putting our girls and young women at risk for HIV infection, intimate partner violence and early pregnancies. And all of this is increasing their risk of maternal mortality and morbidity, including obstetric fistula. Additionally, with the advent of corona and the restrictions around that, that have resulted in escalation and increases in GBV, um, those and the closure of educational facilities and home confinements have also limited access to existing um, health services, including GBV that these young women like. So one of the things that governments need to do, um, in our view, is that there's need to integrate relevant, age-appropriate, rights-based, pro-poor, culturally and gender-sensitive SRH information in the national education cur curricula. And also, because we are pathfinder and always looking for parts, we also think that that should be integrated in other platforms, specifically, health facilities, youth spaces, faith-based organizations, including places of worship, using what we call in Kenya, congregational uh, models, where the leaders of the different faiths are sensitized to share messages around these topics with their congregations. And also, because I'd like to chip in and add to what my colleagues said, um, sports facilities. So yes, we feel there are opportunities to actually reach out and help our girls through policy. Thank you. One of the things that's really hitting me is 
how interconnected all of these are. Jennifer, you mentioned how much sports brings so many of these themes together, that what we're talking about is preparing girls for life and making sure that the definition of quality education includes all of these things. Um, Carol, interesting to hear your perspective that in Kenya, even if kids are in school, they're spending so much time in the classroom in a, in a particular way of learning that's actually not preparing them uh, for life and for work. Um, so um, it's really interesting. I think sometimes we can, we can falsely uh, silo these different issues when in fact it is about comprehensive, comprehensive uh, learning about all of these different issues and gaining mindsets and skills that allow girls to, uh, to live lives of their choosing. So, sorry, Selena, I interrupted there for you. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, it was really inspiring for me. Um, in our final few minutes, um, can you each tell us what changes you hope to see in the coming year and how all of us can help make that happen? Um, Jennifer, let's start with you. Yeah, I mean, in the coming year and in the years to follow, I hope that we can see much more investment in opportunities for girls to benefit from sport, whether or not that's through the education system and or in the, you know, through grassroots and community-based activities. Uh, we, I also hope to see a more level playing field at the elite level for, for women in sport because of the whole power of role models. Uh, additionally, I would like to see more women and men um, as role models, especially the men in the world of sport to help us shatter these stereotypes. And finally, I want to see sport for generation equality to grow as a movement, attracting partners who can really make a difference and help us to expand both knowledge and uh, implementation of the unfinished business of the Beijing platform for action. Thank you. And Pamela, what about you? What would you like to see in the next year? In the next year, I'd like to see several things. Um, I'd like to see us achieve gender equality. And for me, that means delivering on six interlinked areas. The first is health, where we should have increased access to sexual reproductive health and rights services for young adolescent girls and young women. I'd like to see in the area of education, increased investment and elimination of gender-based stigma I'd like to see in the area of safety, elimination of all forms of gender-based violence and harmful traditional practices. And in the area of advocacy, I'd like to see increased political commitment and social norm change to counter these harmful gender norms and support for positive male engagement. I've added two more, and that is creation of economic opportunities for adolescent girls, adolescent girls and young women. And I'd like to see alternative approaches to education provision for out of school youth. And we should explore these. And I'm looking at selected non formal skills development and training opportunities to increase youth employability, things like adolescent girls literacy projects, economic empowerment programs, complementary basic education, technical and vocational education, and skills training. And last but not least, Promotion of social cohesion. There's so much drama in the world, so much fighting, so much tension. But I think if we could work on social cohesion, beginning with the youth, that would be critical for sustainable development. And you know how I'd like us to do it? Through sports, religious, and cultural activities. Thank you. Thank you, Pamela. Carol, what about you? What do you hope happens in the next year? I'm an educator, so I'm gonna talk about the, the school situation where you know I'm based and where my work you know is also based. So um, first of all, I think I will start with the basics. I would like to see uh, girls stay in school. And you know you can say this is a very uh, simple thing, but you know that um, every week, every twice a week, a Kenyan girl is out of school due to school fee. 
So for us to achieve these, you know, uh, great things that we are talking about, we have to begin by keeping school to t uh, girls in school. I shared uh, my background. I was a girl in this neighborhood. And I know that when girls keep on, you know, when they are on their way home all the time, that is a risk. So for us to ensure that girls are in school is one way of ensuring their safety and learning. The second thing that I would like to see is how families and teachers work together to support the girl. Uh, right now, the education that our kids, our children are getting is a bit removed from the real world learning. It's like, you know, let's do this, but it's like, you know, we are shooting in the dark. So I would like to see teachers and families empowered with the knowledge and the tools that they need to help prepare girls for their careers, to talk about car the different career pathways which is really lacking, you know, uh, in my experience. And then the other thing is access to mentors. When I was a little girl growing in Kibera, um, I was the first girl to ever go to high school in my clan, you know. Um, things have changed, but they have not changed that much. When you go to the lower primary, girls are more than boys, but when you go to the upper primary, the story has changed. So I would love to see girls having, you know, strong female role models. And when we, at Big Picture Learning, when we look at female role models, we are looking at female role models who are girls from the communities, who girls can relate to. So, you know, people from Kibera and these community, you know, informal communities who have made it. So girls can look up to them. And then I'd also like to see girls getting out of school more to come and learn outside because as an educator, I know that is where deeper learning happens. So opportunities to internship, uh, students working with mentors in real life, real world um, situations. And then going back to school and working hard because they know why what they are learning in school, you know, why what they are learning is very important towards achieving their, you know, their, the careers of their, of their interest. And then I'd also like to see the government working more closely to school in informal settlements, because at the end of the day, these are our children, the girls, you know, the Kenyan girls are our children. You know. We cannot just work in isolation and organization also partnering more so that we can do what is right for the Kenyan child and the Kenyan girl. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you to all of you. And we at Girl Rising share all of your hopes and we'll be working towards them this year. Um, I encourage everybody to um, go to the website to find out more about each of you and your organizations. Um, thank you again for being with us today um, for this really important conversation. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, honor and a privilege. Thank you for joining us today. It has been a thought provoking day and an inspiring day hearing from our Young Leaders Task Force, hearing the stories of extraordinary girls around the world working to shape a new future. And importantly, the adult like us professionals working to not only identify what prospect, but ways we can better support them. And it was exciting to hear our last panel talk about why investing in girls' education is an investment in our future. Uh, I'm Judith Regis, the Vice President of Programs at Girl Rising, if I had not introduced myself to you. I, as, as a member of the Girl Rising team, I have the privilege of leading our program, and I believe we're doing what is perhaps some of the most innovative work in the girls' education sector. And as someone who has worked in the sector for 20 years, I have seen progress in work still yet to be done. This helps me to appreciate not only what we do at Go Rising, but also what our partners are doing around the world. In this next hour, you will hear a focused discussion with the teachers who are shaping the hearts and minds of our young people as they bring the Go Rising tools to, to students in their communities. And now to tell you a little bit more about this next dialogue with our educators, I'm going to hand over to Lucas. Lucas. Thank you, Judith. I started a Girl Rising Club in my school because I was inspired by a teacher in my school. I have had firsthand experience with the content that will be discussed by these amazing teachers today. 
and it has shaped my world and expanded my worldview. After hearing from this group of teachers, you will understand why I have chosen to be a leading voice in the Girl Rising Young Leaders Task Force. So, please meet Ali Nagel, who teaches at Kip Infinity, a charter public school in New York City. She is speaking home from New Jersey. Elise Reagan, who teaches public school in Quincy, Massachusetts. Lorraine Pondi, a facilitator at Big Picture Learning Kenya. And Abibi Nasir Mizra, a student counselor at Dawood Public School in Karachi, Pakistan. Welcome to you all. My name is Ali Nagel, and I am located here in New Jersey in the United States. We have Elise joining us from Massachusetts, um, Habiba from Pakistan, and Lorraine from Kenya. It's so interesting because even though we're all in, you know, in different places and, and coming to Grow Rising with different priorities and different students, the program fits so nicely, either kind of in like a more specific curriculum, kind of like Elise and Habiba are doing inside schools and it's something that happens regularly and that the families and students and communities can look forward to. But also like Lorraine, you know, kind of supplementing and adding to through community programs. That's how I kind of came to Girl Rising as well. It started as a little add-on to a unit that I already had taught. And then I found that it was like single-handedly the thing that most students were interested in. Elise, you started Girl Rising when you were an eighth grade teacher, right? But you have recently moved down to the grade I teach and love, which is fifth grade. So can you tell us a little bit about how you came to Girl Rising? I used to do this unit like a courage unit. Um, so kids would talk about how they use courage in their everyday lives. And so I found, I was looking, Googling, you know, um, for looking for examples of courage in everyday life and came across Skype for Education, came across Girl Rising and ended up using it um, with my students in 2015. And we turned the hallways into a museum so the kids stood by their projects and they talked about their projects. So then for the last two years, all five middle schools in Quincy did um, a school-wide celebration of education and storytelling and just individual empowerment stories. Your, how you described how you guys really started it and, and loved it and it kind of spread year after year. It reminds me of the, the closing scene in Suma's story where she describes how change is like a song, you know, and, and one person starts singing and then another comes along and another comes along. I had a little girl who so far in the school year had been pretty disinterested and we watched Suma's story. The next morning she came back to class and she was quiet, you know, she didn't really talk, she didn't really participate. And she kind of just came up to me and she said, Miss Nagel, do you know there are more Girl Rising stories? And I said, well, yeah. She said, I looked it up on the internet last night and I watched them all. And I thought like, wow, just this like, you know, 12 minute little clip of these few days that we did. And with that, I had this student who'd been so reluctant, I had her hooked. And I think it was because suddenly the world was so much more open to her. Do any of you have like a, a kind of an aha moment um, with Girl Rising that's a story with a student or a family or the community that makes you think like, okay, okay, like let's do more of this. Yeah, I had a very similar experience to you. Uh, that one, you know, when girl came and she told me and just after the introductory lesson that I went and I searched on Girl Rising and, you know, I did all the videos and that. Like, they were, she was very much enthusiastic about, you know, what we are going to do further in the program. And then uh, while we were doing the lesson, uh, we showed the video of Roxana and, you know, it has a lot of things that touched the students, especially the role of the father, you know, when she messed up with her notebooks and how he supported her. And there was a girl in the class, she stood up and she shared her own story. And it was very really surprising because uh, a lot of times the students don't share these details in the classroom, especially when they are not very good 
when they are not very pleasant. And she shared that how it is very difficult for a girl in her family to get the education and how her father supported her. And, you know, it's a real struggle to come to school daily because there are a lot of people who tell her parents that, you know, this is not something really important and you know you should invest your money and things better than that and you know that was the moment of the connection for the students as well because you know all of a sudden students realized that see she was there in our class but they didn't know that how difficult it was for her just to come to school really see and while we all cry for a lot of other stuff, you know, related to the kind of lunch that we want to have and the kind of uh, pencil box that we want to have. And there's a girl among us, you know, who actually struggled just to come to school daily. And, you know, apart from all the struggles and the problems, I found these lessons very important and helpful for the connection between my students as well. They started understanding each other in a much better way, uh, they grew up in better listeners, I feel. Mm -hmm. Lorraine, your students started watching Roxana's story too. Um, and I think like Habiba mentioned, you know, one of the nice things about that story is it is the role of the father. Um, you had some pretty interesting reflections from young men in your, in your um, class, right? Can you share some of those? Yes. Um, so initially when we, when we were introducing the girl rising, um, they thought that this program was particularly targeting just girls, but we included them. And so initially they didn't know there's anything wrong about gender or anything, um, if the inequalities that we witness because of gender. And so when, after viewing the story of Roxana, they could relate now, they were able to relate the story of Roxana to what is happening in their own communities. Because initially, they were not aware that this is actually a problem. They were just, oh, this is just, it's just something that happens. But once they saw it, they were able to relate the challenges. And then during our discussion sessions, um, I thought that maybe the, the girls would be the first to answer because the stories were reflecting their own experiences. But to my surprise, it was the boys who were sharing about, their, they were sharing their reflections about these experiences. And one of the boys said, I, 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 am, I, I, I knew this because my mom shared that she went through this as a teenager. So they were able to relate now more. They are becoming more understanding of, oh, what is gender is? And there's some of the challenges that come with gender issues, you know. So it's been interesting and they continue to, ask questions and make suggestions just how to address some of this because you know gender is very sensitive here mm. it's attached to our religions background and also to culture so some of the ways that the boys are trying to reach out out of class is how can we go about this um, and not make uh, our parents or make our neighbors feel uncomfortable mm -hmm. so we are still figuring how to encourage them how to empower them to go about the discussion outside the classroom. Elise, and that's like, I think a big part of, I know like in our little girl rising teacher community, I always hear such wonderful things about the agency and the community artwork and projects that you guys are doing. How do you think Girl Rising has like impacted your students in the moment? I mean, Lorraine's talking about kind of these community conversations. What do you notice with your older students and then now maybe even with some of your younger students? So for my students what I really like is that they sort of have the option of like how they want they can either personalize it or they can keep it focused on the content so depending on what their comfort is and what one of the things that I really enjoy doing with them because I focus a lot of my school year on reading and writing is taking that into other media but I was watching a project from my students two years ago and it had me tearing up and it, it's that, like they did a Cardi B song and they did like, oh, I am a scholar getting A's on high honor was their chorus. And I was like tearing up this morning. These girls were so funny and so fun about this very serious content. And then they just like had their own artistic spin on it and, you know, incorporated pop culture to give kids those platforms and say, go be you. 
-hmm. and like these are the topics that we're talking about but like do it on your own um on your own creative genius i just feel like they don't they don't disappoint you know and um i like that the curriculum gives us the tools to kind of take it um take it somewhere i think that is when you said that it's so interesting because they are such the stories revolve around you know such important but heavy topics and I teach primarily nine and ten year olds and you know a lot of people ask like is this too much for kids and I think we forget that just kind of like with Habiba's story you know kids go home and they are researching and like with the rain story like they know because of their communities and, and their own personal lived experiences but yet they do have this wonderful way of of t taking these very serious important topics and making them their own. When I was having a conversation with kids the other day about the upcoming election in the US, one of my students said, well, you know, like, well, we can't vote. So she actually said, what does it matter? Because if you vote for Joe Biden or if you vote for Donald Trump, aren't they kind of gonna just do the same thing and things won't change? And it spiraled into this conversation. Here I am like, voting is so important. You know, it's our right. Like you, everybody who's 18, talk to anybody you know who's 18. Um, and I thought to the Girl Rising stories about how so many of them are young girls. I think about Wadley, who's a favorite of mine, or Roxana. And I think about how in their own ways, they did something as impactful or as, as powerful as kind of like that vote, you know, like the, the making the change in their community. And it's something I think that can, it's one story, but it can really take on its own personal message all across the globe. I read in, in something, Lorraine, you sent that like the boys, they're young boys now, but soon they will be somebody's father, they will be somebody's uncle, they will be in a, in a place of decision making. And so exposing them and educating them to, to what women and young girls are facing is, a, is an important part of their own education too. Yes. And if, there's a story about Mariama that I'm looking forward to, to share with them. Um, reason being, uh, one of the ways we teach our students is for them to pursue their talents, to be creative. And with Mariama's stories, um, she got involved, she got work in radio, mm -hmm. and she also came from a polygamous family too. But there's an aspect of both parents, both the stepmother and the mother supported her, and the stepdad too supported her. So it, it brings an element of how family support can, you know, can influence um, the way people go about their creative talents. And um, that is, uh, polygamy is, um, unfortunately, or fortunately, is something we see often. Mm -hmm. We come from such families, but people normally don't know that it can be a harmonious situation. They're used to seeing polygamous family whereby there's a, a lot of quarrels, a lot of division, but that is not the story in Mariama's story. You could see the stepmother stepped in and, you know, talked to the, influenced the dad to give her a chance and listen to her. So I'm hoping they can also see this story um, and say that also polygamous family don't have to be conflicting always. There's also the element of people can live in harmony and be supported and they can be supported even though they come from a polygamous family. Habiba, have you, um, have your kids and students had a chance to watch any of the chapters that revolve kind of around your neighboring countries? I know there's one that takes place in Afghanistan. Have your students had a chance to watch that story? Oh, that particular scene in the introductory video, I think, where uh, that girl from Afghanistan is there. And that was something very interesting because I had a chance to share my story as well because uh, I got married when I was 17. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was... Uh, you know, there were multiple reasons. We know that the things are very different and difficult here. But then when I got the chance, uh, I also got the chance to share that I did not stop there. Yes, I got married when I was 17, but that was not the end. 
and that is you know this is what we need to see basically that is okay there are situations that we have to face but it does not mean that we just stop there and give up whatever has happened to us so that was something again and uh, you know uh, i think every video has something which every student uh, was able to relate to doesn't matter if it was from a neighboring country or from somewhere else it had something uh, that made students think you know about the uh, stuff going on around them uh, when we were watching that uh, video from bardley i think and you know like that i i loved that video actually you know there were small moments here and there and everyone i think you know even when we were watching that introductory video there's a particular scene there where she said that you know even if you stop me i'll keep coming back here if you allow me and that was the moment like a bit but uh, what i was thinking uh, we were discussing the role of a mother or father i think in every video uh, it uh, is somewhere you know the part that a mother or father is playing was very important like we all uh, saw that uh, wardley was a very confident girl she had the those the strength she had the determination but there was something you know even before that earthquake stuff and everything uh, i see that that was the role of a mother that that girl grew into that confident child who was determined and you know who was confident enough to talk to anyone and to tell that what does she want mm -hmm. so the role of parenting was very important in every video Uh, I I love this part, and I think we these videos can be used to educate parents as well. That how things could be totally changed if a parent supports a child in a different way. There was a photo that you sent to us, Elise, that was a young woman in an auditorium, a young student, and speaking to what looked like potentially hundreds of people, students. teachers family members the student that you're talking to is a student that i had 2 years ago and when i talked to her a little bit about it she's like it just makes me feel like i am able to share my voice she's like when we talk about the stories and like what i do have to say does matter and i think prior to this she's like i didn't always feel like i had like a big voice to share on this but my perspective is important and she was um she's from cape verde and she was saying like um how just growing up with her grandmother always sort of like taking care of her and teaching her the importance of speaking up like she she just felt like it kind of clicked and it was just really sweet a little bit of that like wadley spirit in her i yeah. love that part you know when the habiba mentioned you know when wadley stands up and just says like you could you could turn me away a million times you know i'm still going to come back and the kids and when we watched wadley i mean i've had my fifth graders like erupt into applause you know when the teacher friendly says like okay fine sit down and one student says you know but miss nagel the best part is when she sits down and her her little friend next to her holds her hand under the desk and i think it just kind of goes to show that kind of at least like your student and her brother that like you know we do kind of all have these quiet little allies and these people who are cheering us on whether they're the stepmother mm -hmm. know or our parents and so i think that's something that resonates you know outside of a classroom outside of a program um and one of the things even though we know that this school year has started somewhat you know unconventionally with some of us in person some of us not in person i think the great thing about girl rising is that it is it's like a um packaged mobile unit you know we can experience it together um even if we're all looking at our own computers and even look at us you know we're all from across the world and we have bonded over these stories of girls who we probably will never meet i think our time is winding down i feel like i could talk to you guys forever um but is there anybody who has any last any last girl rising thoughts a message or a a a note you want to send us off with um i i can share um so one of the uh, one of the ideas we have because we cannot treat the community but we can raise the community through our students so one of the way we are thinking about sustaining the program is to create a girl rising uh, club at the school so whereby even new students can join the club and they, they can discuss this and then use our students as the as, as you know as the change makers so when they go home 
they can create these conversations, they can talk to people in their community and share what they've learned with, um, under our, our, our program, the Girl Rising program. Yeah. I think uh, there are uh, a lot of things in that whole program which every teacher, even um, the person uh, who is teaching any other subject in the class, can use those things in their class to make it a usual practice, you know, to um, include all these things in the regular routines, um, in the regular periods. Um, because uh, I remember that during one of the lessons that was about knowing the strengths uh, it has. And, there were a lot of the students who had this in mind. They said, I don't have any strength. Mm. But then other students, you know, they came up and they actually told them, see, you have this, you have this. And it was such a lovely moment, everybody telling each other that you have this in you, which we usually don't see. The mm -hmm. students also do not get time, you know, to talk about such stuff and tell each other that how amazing they all are and how amazing they look to each other. So I think that we only can pick the small things from every lesson uh, from the curriculum and thing, and can make them a part of the regular classes as well. Uh, that is what I think that we can do. I love that. I really enjoy listening to you all talk about your experiences. Now I have like all these ideas that I'm like, oh, I should try it. <laughs> so, so thank you. Yeah, that's the great thing about, you know, putting a bunch of teachers together. <laughs> it just kind of like gets the wheels turning. Pink. Pink.